Cryptic. So today what I'm playing is my recorded solve of a puzzle that Simon put up about three weeks ago. And I'll give a link to the original video in the comments. This was from the Nikolai website. And this puzzle was so hard that it took Hideaki Joe, one of the best solvers in the world by far, um, 68 minutes to solve online. Um, even Tom Collier, who's certainly one of the two best solvers in the UK, he's appeared making videos for us, he's a brilliant technical solver, took 34 minutes. And Tom's one of the, as I say, one of the two best in the UK, certainly better than me, but um, what is good in this context? Well, the measure of good to me is, is the speed of solving. And, um, the way that the World Championship decides who the best solvers are is by looking at um, the correctness of solving Sudoku's variant Sudoku's mainly, but also some of these classics, which is just an ordinary Sudoku. Um, and then it takes the time. So if you're accurate and you're fast, then you're a very good Sudoku solver. So I'm all about speed, as you know. Now, what that leads me to have to do sometimes is to make an assumption, because I am not particularly good at spotting the various X-Wing and Fin Sashimi and um, Swordfish methods that Simon's been taking us through. Now, those are, those are great methods for understanding the logic of Sudoku puzzles and being able to sort of solve them with just um, logic. So what I'm doing at this stage in the puzzle is, is the straightforward logic, is spotting things by elimination, particularly using the array logic, the, the rows and columns that we've looked at before, and that's the most important step. But what I then have to do, and I'm about to do it here I think, is to pick a cell which is going to be useful, probably is to pick um, a box in which a number has to be in one of two particular places and make a choice. So given that I'm using Excel um, on this occasion for solving, normally I'd do an equivalent thing with um, paper and pencil. In fact, I'd move from, from solving with a biro to solving with a pencil. Um, and so I'm creating a copy of the, sheet, of, the sp of the spreadsheet here. And now I'm going to start from this point with an assumption. The assumption that one has to choose, one has to choose fairly carefully. Um, you, ideally you have to choose something that will help if it's right and will clearly help if you know it's wrong. So just to make sure I know where this assumption started, I'm going to highlight the cell in, in a colour and I, this cell that I'm choosing to put a 1 in is clearly going to help sort those 1's out down there and I think it's going to have some knock-on effects. Look, you can immediately place the 9 in the central column, for instance, in fact, I'm working on something else when I originally solved this. Um, getting the twos and eights sorted out in the top section there. And uh, as, a, as you see, this is allowing me to make progress. Now, the important thing about choosing that one up there is that if, I, if that wasn't a one, then the one would have had to be in this column. That would have given us something else down here. Um, and in fact, in that very cell where the 1 is, if that wasn't a 1 again, because we've got 5742 above it and 683 alongside it, if that wasn't a 1, then it would have to be a 9. So in fact, this time, what I've chosen on is a cell that had only two possibilities. And if that was a 9, given that 9, then this would be a 9, and then we'd be making some other forms of progress. So. There is a bit of luck involved in selecting which cell to um, make a choice on. And then what I'm, what I'm doing is going back to the normal method of using rows and columns on this assumption. Now, if at some point I notice that um, I've got an impossibility, I've got a cell that can't be filled, or more likely two cells in a box row or column, two numbers repeated in a box row or column, um, then I will return to the version 
to the puzzle as it was. Now in a competition setting that involves me using an eraser very hard and very quickly and rubbing out all the pencil. In this version um, I would go back to the to the sheet that I'd started and replace that one with a nine and carry on. So that's the general approach I'm using and that means that I can focus on just doing the um, now what's happening uh, I'm just sizing the cells so actually my time here <laughs> some of it was wasted on uh, me faffing around with Excel but um, doesn't matter too much okay I'm sizing the cells here so that we can fit in three numbers in one cell uh, because I've established that in this box for instance 2 and 8 must be in those two cells now these are 3, 4 and 9 but th only the the top one can't be a 4 and the bottom one can't be a 3 so the middle cell we still don't really know it could be 3, 4 or 9 um, so that's the method I use and that means that you know I don't have to be looking for these extremely technical clever things now Simon calls this me guessing and I mean obviously that is a guess or an assumption um, Thomas Snyder has called it a bifurcation which is a nice scientific sounding name where you split the possible solving path into one of two ways and then you're prepared to go back and go back to the fork in the road where you split it and take the other fork and you know I think that's a very logical way to go about things but as you can see from the titles of some of the videos Simon's put up since then since, since I kind of explained this once. Um, no guessing is, is the technician's preferred way. And I mean, that's understandable. However, uh, my view of that is that there are definitely, it's fun when there are different ways of getting to the solution of a problem. And if this way is quicker, and it was for me, then that's certainly the way that I'd, all, I'd always assume would be the best. Um, and as I say, it means that I can spend my time on the puzzle thinking about the same types of logic rather than having to kind of delve for disconnected cells that might have the same digits as you might need in a swordfish or x-wing method. So it works for me. Um, in fact, in this puzzle, it gets to a point, you can see I've slowed down with the deductions I've been able to make. And in fact, I now make a second, deduct, a second assumption. So I'm going to find a cell to highlight. And this one's quite an interesting one. It can only be a 5 or a 7. And whichever it is, is going to fix which column, it's going to fix what this cell can't be. So it would be a very useful cell to... Um, again bifurcate on to find a fork in the road and obviously you can either get lucky with the assumption that you make and it turns out to be right and you complete the puzzle or you can be what seems to be unlucky but in fact if you choose one of these assumptions and immediately the puzzle goes wrong or within a minute the puzzle goes wrong well, that's very helpful because now you know for sure what the correct version of the place that you chose was and with a quick bit of quick rubbing out and a cost of about a minute you're back on track with a new deduction and you can race away um, from that point so these are these can be huge time savers now i'm not necessarily recommending this for everyone but we do get some requests to see how the guess method and i mean i hate calling it that but that's what it is um, works for some instances so i thought i'd put up my solve of this puzzle and in terms of how much time it can save you as i said hideaki joe took 68 minutes tom collier's recorded time was 34 minutes but if you watch simon's video and i do recommend it if you haven't seen it um, there's some fantastic logic in this puzzle that i'm missing but Tom Collier also came up with that logic, but it turned out he had two goes at the puzzle. And he came up, I think he, he, he said in the comments that he uh, came up with the really clever bit of logic at the beginning in about 20 minutes on his first go, which is impressive. But then it took him still, this puzzle being as hard as it is, another 25 minutes to finish off when he knew that. So here we go, I'm now creating another copy of the spreadsheet 
and making a choice. Uh, in fact, I didn't go for that cell, and there's probably some reason for this. So I'm making a choice in this bottom left cell of this box here uh, to go with an eight. And again, I'm gonna color it so I know where I went wrong. So if this goes wrong now, and that's helpful because that fixes an eight there. Now you know it's five and seven in these two boxes. Um, five, seven, one, three, six, four. So eight has to be over here. Eight has to be up here. And in fact, that five has been very helpful because of these two fives up here. It's fixed that five. This cell will become a five. And again, the puzzle's off again and flowing. So I've had to make two assumptions. Obviously, if it goes wrong at this point, I'm going to have to wind back, take that eight out, and replace it with a six, which I think is the only other possibility there, um, and proceed from that point on. Now, in fact, that would be helpful because that six there with that six there would mean one of these two cells is a six. Therefore, that would now be a pair of sixes and nines. And when you get pairs in boxes, that's very powerful. So that's why that, that cell was chosen for those purposes. As I say, if it went wrong at this point, then we, un we rewind back. And if it then goes wrong again, we have to rewind back and change that yellow cell. So in a way, it's a fairly complicated way of using the guess method, but it does it really fast. And as I say, this took Hideaki Joe over an hour. It took Tom Collier on his combined attempts, I, I reckon around three quarters of an hour. It's an unbelievably hard puzzle. Now with the guess method that I've been employing, um, this solve takes me something around 13 minutes. And as you can see, some of that was messing around with Excel. So, you know, maybe somewhere around 12 minutes, which is still, um, in my terms, a very long time to solve a classic Sudoku puzzle, but it does get it solved. It still gives you the feeling of satisfaction of filling the grid correctly. Um, if you're looking for speed, um, and I have to admit that my main interest in solving Sudoku is being able to do it as quickly as I can. I, you know, I, I'm very interested in getting the right solution. I don't mind at all knowing what the clever methods are, but if I don't need them, then, then I'm going to go as quickly as I can. My, I was comparing using this kind of method in my mind to hammering in a nail with your head into a block of wood. I mean, you could do it, but if you could get a hammer, that would be smarter. My son came up with a different analogy, which I'll play here. And uh, I quite like that as well, because um, the idea of Indiana Jones getting out his gun to defeat the sword wielder is a bit like me getting out the uh, bifurcation method to defeat the impossible Sudoku puzzle. And maybe sometimes even to defeat the really clever mathematicians and logicians who can spot the advanced techniques. But that's more what our blog's about, is teaching you those advanced techniques. So this is just another method that you could add to um, your arsenal of solving. So here I'm just checking, because it, I didn't want to put up a solution that was wrong, I'm just checking that every row and column at least has got one to nine in because uh, I might have missed something. And that is a bit of a risk with this method is you might get it wrong and not even realize. So there's always a bit of danger. But in this case, it was correct. And that's how the puzzle was solved. So thank you for watching. I hope that's of some interest. It's an unusual one. It's not teaching you a clever new technique. It's teaching you a, uh, a side road. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Hope to see you again on Cracking the Cryptic. Bye for now.